context of this is that I started looking at the Police and Crime Commissioner elections, particularly in Kent in 2013, with a view to doing um, a journal article at that point looking at the coverage. And, and the problem was I didn't really know, but I haven't collected a lot of data, what to do with it. Um, I picked it up again this year because we are literally on the brink of the, of the next campaign starting up. Um, the, uh, Notice of election will be issued next week. Candidates must be confirmed by April the 7th. So it's just about to get started again this year in earnest. And I felt this was a good time to look back at 2012 and see what we can learn from the first ever elections. But this, that what I'm presenting today, is essentially setting out a methodology and a framework and a background um, for an article that I'm going to publish looking at the 2016 election. So while I will draw some conclusions based on 2012, this isn't the end product of what I'm doing, really. This is, this is the background to it. Um, to start that off, I suppose it's worth just reminding everyone, particularly since statistically most people don't know, um, exactly what the police and crime commissioners are. Um, both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats went into the 2010 general election with uh, a stated mission to overhaul the local police authorities and to inject an amount of democracy into the way that the police is run, extra accountability in the police. This was not seen at the time as a minor change. It wasn't seen as something that would be ignorable. There was quite a lot of fanfare at the time about this as a major change in the way that the police was organised and run and in the ability of an electorate to hold the police to account for its policies. Um, there was quite a lot of excitement about it. I put up a, a quote here um, from the um, Royal United Services Institution Journal, which was published just before the election, which, which points out that if this election had gone well, these police and crime commissioners would have had far greater personal mandates than anybody else in their county. They would have a far greater mandate than any MP, far greater mandate than any county councillor, that their personal mandate could potentially be huge. Um, to put that in perspective in Kent, Julian Brazier gets elected as MP of Canterbury from an electorate of around 150,000 people. Anne Barnes has been chosen as police and crime commissioner by an electorate of 1.2 million. That means that there is the, the potential here for someone who is very significant as a voice in their, in their community. And that was how this was framed in the build-up to the election. But we know that it didn't quite work out that way, and I, I've built this as the untold story. So let's get the told story out of the way rather quickly. Um, the national turnout in the elections in November 2012 was a, a measly 15.1%. Um, the Electoral Commission immediately started to look into this and concluded that the extremely low, con low turnout must be a concern for anyone who cares about democracy. It was the lowest turnout in British peacetime history. Um, what's very interesting is when you drill down into those figures. Um, 5.49 million votes cast out of an electorate of 36 million people. 5.8 million postal vote ballots were issued to people, and half of those almost were returned, 48.2%. But that left 30 million in-person voters, people who had to go along to a ballot box on November the 15th, 2012, of which only 9.2% bothered to do so. Um, that's the real failure in this case, and we can see that when you look against this election compared to other elections in a similar time scale. 48% and 9% in the 2012 crime commissioner elections, but you look at the local elections that were held that May across the country, where you see a kind of still relatively low, 24% people voting in, in person, 68% um, ballots, uh, postal ballots, similar kind of figures in the Welsh local elections, and as you'd expect, a much higher proportion in a general election. But there is something rather dismal about that turnout in the police and crime commissioners. There were a number of surveys done to try and explain why this turnout was. Um, in Electoral Commission survey, as part of their report, they discovered that 75% of those voters, 75% of the 5.5 million people that voted, said they voted out of a sense of civic responsibility. These are the hardcore electorate, the people that will vote just because there is an election. Um, the government relied on those people. The way it set about advertising this election pretty much was the if you build it they will come approach. They set an election up, they didn't give people an awful lot of information about the candidates themselves. And they just hoped that there would be some kind of automatic engagement. 2%, only 2% of people who voted said that they were voting for crime-related reasons in an election that was about nothing else. There was no other topic up for grabs in this election. This was all about how your county, your metropolitan area is policed. 
2% of people said that they, they did so because of crime. That's worthy of a little bit of investigation. Um, I, I offer the next slide uh, merely as an anecdote, really, as part of the background. But can that, can that possibly suggest that the electorate isn't interested in crime? Well, of course, our gut feeling instantly, quite rightly, is to say, of course not. People are very interested in crime. It always comes up in election campaigns. There was some work done... Um, in 2005, this is a slightly ageing anecdotal example, um, which looked at Hold the Front Page and examined the number of newspaper campaigns run by topic in each year from 2000 uh, to 2003. In each of those years, crime was the second most popular topic for a newspaper campaign. That's because crime has a very important narrative position in our communities, in our lives. It feeds into questions of justice, safety, security. Um, newspapers campaign on, on these issues all the time because our readers care about them. And we wouldn't run the campaigns if they didn't. Um, so we know that crime is a burning issue. We just also know that somehow that didn't get reflected in the vote in November 2015. Well, so... The people who didn't vote were a much more interesting group of people to talk to in the, in the, in the aftermath of that election. 45% of those that didn't vote in an um, electoral reform society poll said that they didn't vote because there was not enough information about candidates. The background to this is that the government made a very interesting decision in the run-up to the elections. It decided that it would not fund a mail shot for candidates, that the only information it made publicly available was a website explaining how the election would be run, and then it had a couple of optional extras for people who wanted to find out more. A website which listed the candidates by name but didn't actually link to their personal websites for any policy information, which had 2 million visitors before November 2015. 2 million out of a potential electorate of 36 million, and a phone line where you could phone up and ask for a booklet which explained more about the election and the candidates, which had 200,000 calls before November 2015. So a very, very small amount of people engaging in these methods, the official methods of getting information about candidates. The other, uh, the other issues that were highlighted by the Electoral Commission in its report were that the time of year of the election was significant. It was held in November. November is not a time, you know, we're used to the idea of Americans holding elections in November. In this country, it's not a popular time of year. We tend to find that the fact that it's darker in the evenings prevents people from going out. The weather's worse. There are all kinds of environmental factors which affect people voting. There are also other factors at that time of year which affect people voting. It's a time when you're looking forward to Christmas. You have other things on your mind. Elections in this country tend to be held spring-summer because that's a time when there is a much greater focus on that kind of thing. You can get people out a lot easier. That was, a, that was one uh, particular criticism. And that's been addressed this year. It's being held in May this year. Um, so they also said, uh, a small number of people said they didn't agree with the election at all. And we'll come back to, to that issue in, in a while. But essentially they didn't agree with the idea that a politicised post had been created at the top of the police. People were very uncomfortable about that. Um, and that's something that we'll come back to in a bit. I've chosen in particular to look at Kent. Um, before we get into what I've, I've looked at. Kent is not a, 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 an atypical county. Um, it slightly, runs slightly above the average on the turnout, 16%. Um, 204,917 people voting. Um, only 7.5% of the eligible Kent voters chose Anne Barnes as their first choice candidate in this peculiar system where you have to get first choice votes and then there is a second choice ballot as well if no one wins an outright majority at the first count. 7.5% of people chose her as their first choice. Um, not untypical across the country. Not untypical also for the fact that the election was won by an independent candidate because this, this fear about politicisation did lead to a, a, a quite a successful election for independence. Anne Barnes, in her victory speech, uh, and in her defence of her victory of, uh, at the day later, said, I got quite a big mandate in Kent, I got quite a big mandate in Kent, because we won very comprehensively here in the county. Not only was Anne Barnes and the other police and crime commissioners spinning it that way, the Home Office was spinning it that way. For them, this was not an electoral disaster. It seems quite difficult to maintain that argument, to be honest with you. But, um, in any event, this led to a number of questions for me. Um, about how it was covered. Uh, and we'll see that the media immediately, the first edition of the Kent Messenger published after the elections was the Monday edition of the Medway Messenger, which led on the words, police farce, apathy wins. 
put a fairly emphatic verdict on the real result of the election. Um, and, it, and it raises lots of kind of interesting questions about what was happening in the build-up to this vote. How did a paper like the Kent Messenger, which is the only real county-wide paper in, this, uh, in Kent, how did it approach this coverage? How did it approach informing an electorate? And did it try to engage an electorate in this particular poll? To what extent is it the media's responsibility to do that, to engage? And does it tell us anything about this narrative, about the lack of engagement and the 9% of people that turn, turned out at the polls? Um, they're, they're, my, they're my questions, and I'm going to do this. Um, I've done this in, in relation to 2012 and will do in 2016, um, with a couple of, of reference points. The first being an, an analysis of the news values that you can see in the way that the Kent Messenger has covered these elections. Uh, Harkup and O'Neill wrote the definitive modern version of the codified news values. They reassessed their news values this year. Um, many of you will be familiar with, with an earlier version which appears in Harkup's book, Journalism, Principles and Practice. They, they revised those values this year because obviously now we're dealing with an online environment. They're looking at issues like shareability. But they also saw an opportunity to go back into those values and think a little bit differently about how certain types of stories rise to the top of the news food chain. In their, in their earlier version, they didn't think conflict was particularly a separate issue to bad news. They thought that they were one and the same. Given the chance to think about that again, they, they, they saw in this case that they thought conflict was worth codifying separately. I think for election journalists, that's quite an interesting um, observation, the idea of, of conflict, um, which is a really important narrative in the way that elections are covered, um, one group of people set against another. The general principle here is that stories of higher news value will t tend to appear closer to the front end of a newspaper and they will tend to appear on right-hand pages. And Harkup is very much interested in the idea of story selection. Above all else, what makes one story worth running over another? The weakness that they recognise in their own work is that it doesn't talk an awful lot about story treatment. That it doesn't necessarily allow us to explain the decisions that are made by journalists and how they portray the news that they have selected to cover. So to, to address that, which I think is an important part of analysing these elections, I've also had a look at a couple of um, a couple of different studies. One is, is work by Helen Capel and Monica Bednarek, who set out a methodology for a discursive analysis of text, looking at headlines, language, images, and the way that page design helps to um, set out the news values and the important issues of a story. Um, and we're going to have a little look at how that, how that is, is, is done in a, in a second with a couple of examples. The other thing is that these stories, no, no individual election story stands in isolation. They form part of a broader discourse between political actors, the media and the electorate, which forms an election campaign. There is a much wider kind of um, narrative being drawn here. And there is some interesting work being done on how uh, narrative proximity affects voters, about how the narrative put forward by candidates in elections resonates or doesn't with a certain group of people. The, um, the study that, I, that I've quoted here, the Shifa, Sh Shenhav and Goldstein one, looks at in, in Israel in particular, national narratives in Israel and how they have affected election results, which is a very particular thing, which is not directly comparable to the Police and Crime Commissioner elections in Kent. But you can extrapolate from it. There are some interesting narratives at the background of this in terms of how people perceive the safety of their society, the fear of crime. And in an extent, in a successful election, these candidates should be using those narratives to try and win over their electorate. How much did these intrude into the election campaign was something that I was very interested in. There isn't an awful lot of value in a, in a purely quantitative study because the numbers of stories that I'm looking at are very low. But I thought it would be worth just setting out to begin with a little bit of information about how much was covered and where it was covered. So this shows the three weeks uh, in, the, in November in the build-up to the campaign. I've separated out my coverage into three news weeks, constructed news weeks, um, built around the Kent Messenger's deadlines. Uh, the KM... Um, has a couple of very large papers, the Medway editions and the, and the Maidstone editions, which publish on a Friday. They missed the election. So what I've done is constructed a week which runs essentially Friday to Thursday rather than Monday to Friday. When I'm anal analysing coverage, it means that I can look at the final week's coverage from all editions across the group together as a whole. In doing so, I've looked at every major group, well, every, every group of newspapers, every family of newspapers within the KM group, and you'll see that on the, in 
November the 1st, the first um, available edition after postal votes closed. Uh, there, were no, there was no news coverage in Kent whatsoever of the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner elections. In the second week, there were three news stories. Uh, in the last week, there were seven. Alongside that, there were a number of columns. It's worth pointing out that an awful lot of this material was actually written by one person. The way that the KM works is that Paul Francis, as their main political editor, syndicates his copy across the group. I've put ten news stories up there. In fact, there are four. Um, there are five different treatments of one story written by Paul Francis within week two. There are uh, three different treatments of a second story written by... Paul Francis in week three, and then two other stories which are actually unique stories. Um, so four stories were published essentially by the KM group, but they were given different treatments um, by different editions. It's not an enormous amount of, of coverage going on. Um, alongside that, Paul also writes a column, and an awful lot of those columns are accounted for by his work as well. So he, he was essentially a one-man team covering this election across the county. Um, we see a predictable build-up of momentum here towards election day, but it starts from the lowest possible base. I think that's worth I mean, zero stories three weeks out from the election, uh, building up to seven in the week of the election. In terms of where those stories appeared, um, again, tells quite an interesting story. Um, only three stories out of those ten appeared at what we would regard as the front end. The, the pages one to nine are where the real business end of the newspaper is, the strongest stories. Um, three of those stories appeared there, and only one of those was on the right-hand page. In the week leading up to the election, we can see that there were three stories run at page 30 or, or further back from page 30. So in the week of the election, some readers in Kent were having to delve quite far into the book in order to find out anything about the election. The vast majority of stories were collected between pages 10 and 29. I haven't included in this chart any letters or leaders because they appear in fixed positions in the paper that would kind of distort things. This is about the decisions made by journalists about where stories should go. So that prime real estate, one to nine, really it, it doesn't feature that heavily. And we can sort of see that there is already, just from these figures, that the the news value of this election in Kent was not regarded that highly, that there were other stories going on at the time filling the front ends that had nothing to do with this election at all. But we need to have a look at a closer look at some of the stories in order to fully understand why that is. And I've picked out one of Paul's stories, a, a story that was run five times, four times in the second week, um, but we're given different treatments. It's a story that starts with this intro. The important things to note about this story is that it has absolutely no quotes in it. Um, thinking about Harkip, Harkups and O'Neill's um, idea of conflict being an important part of the news value certainly would be of, of any election coverage. No quotes whatsoever suggest that that possibly isn't happening here. The angle is in principally informative and factual. Um, there isn't really a, a strong narrative in there. And there's an interesting qualification in the intro. Just one week left before voters have the chance to go to the polls next Thursday. Not before voters go to the polls, but have the chance to go. That could sound like voting is a privilege. You have the chance to go to Disney World next week. But it could also imply that there is some kind of additional kind of optional value to this election. That actually, you, know, you have the chance to go, but you don't have to. Um, there's something quite interesting about that. And it's not the kind of language that you will always see in election stories. It doesn't name any of the candidates this story, which um, I think was quite interesting. And it also has two unattributed statements in it. One saying that these were the most far-reaching reforms to police in a generation, which isn't attributed to anybody. The other saying that there are fears of a low turnout, but the story doesn't say where those fears are coming from or quote anybody giving voice to them. So how did the newspapers cover this story that was sent out to every news desk in Kent and every news editor was given the option to run it? Three of them did something very similar. All appear on left-hand pages, page 14, 40 and 30, in Ashford, Medway and Maidstone. For the Maidstone edition, the one on the far right, this was the last chance for them to publish a story before the election. This appeared on um, Friday, November the 9th. So page 30, with a list of candidates and a box of stories, um, a, a, a box which has... Um, short statements from the, um, from the candidates on a series of, of set questions. We'll come back to that nearer the end. Um, there's a uniformity of style and treatment here. I think you can notice that the questions in the headlines, questions tend to suggest that there isn't a strong angle going on here. It's not trying to force the debate in any particular direction. It has a kind of beigeness of tone to it. Um, and what makes that interesting is all of these are used at the back end of the book. The other story that, that was based on this work was used at the front end, and the difference in it is, is quite marked. 
This was a page nine story in Gravesend, which takes as its angle fears of a low turnout as police election nears. That's based on an unattributed claim in the story. There is no quote backing up that there are fears of a low turnout. It's something that Paul has picked out, essentially, of the ether. Not inaccurate, but not attributed. They knew, um, they had two options. They could have used Paul's assertion that this is one of the most far-reaching reforms of policing in a generation for the angle. They didn't. That's the more positive angle, possibly the New Day approach. But um, the... Um, They've chosen a very traditional view. They've gone for a bad news story here as the top line, as the, as the headline. And that gives the story more news value. It justifies it appearing much further ahead in the paper than the other stories did. Page 9 as opposed to page 14, 30 and 40. That angle has been generated through treatment of the story, but no additional journalism has taken place here. They have just picked out something from the story and generated a treatment. And it's a decision that seems to have caused some kind of eternal conflict within that newspaper, because just a couple of pages further back, there's a leader column. And this leader column predicts accurately the fears about the mandate of the police and crime commissioners if there is a low turnout and it does worry about the, the health of regional democracy if that low turnout does happen. It makes it clear that there was a conscious decision to run a story at the front end of the Gravesend Messenger. The Gravesend Messenger is saying to its readers that these elections are important, you should worry about them, and it wants to have a story at the front end because of that. But in order to justify running the story at the front end, it had to find a spin on the story that was actually negative. There's an interesting, curious kind of clash there, and I think it would have, it would have been very difficult to them, for them to run a story on page nine saying, wow, this is the most significant reform of police in a generation, please vote. That, that doesn't generally chime with what we understand about news values. It's also notable right at the end um, that this leader places the blame on voters, on the electorate, for not being engaged. Um, it says people are simply unaware, if they don't read newspapers or look at websites, listen to radio, watch TV programmes, they can't complain. Well, it's not necessarily true, because in Sittingbourne and Canterbury there wasn't a single news story written by the KM group about the election uh, in the three weeks leading up to the vote. Uh, the Graves and Messenger asked in its, um, in its leader whether the media and the government needed to knock on every door and shout, wake up, there's an important event coming up. Funnily enough, uh, with prescience, the Electoral Commission suggested exactly that sort of thing would have helped. It said that what should have happened in 2012 was a leaflet should have been popped through every door telling people who, what their candidates, who their candidates were. In any other election, you would have relied on your local newspaper. You can't imagine major local elections, general elections, without that kind of information appearing prominently within a local newspaper in the run-up to the vote. But here, in certain areas, there really was no mention. Sittingbourne made no mention whatsoever of the election in the three weeks before it happened. Um, just to put that in context, the Kentish Gazette series and the Sittingbourne Messenger, both of which didn't run any stories, are, represent um, around 210,000 of the 1.2 million electorate. So a fifth of the electorate. Eventually, if, if, they, if that electorate was relying on the Kent Messenger, obviously that's one of the, one of the things I'll talk about at the end. But that, that part of the electorate would not have found out about, their, um, about this election from their local paper. So what did run? Ten stories, and I'll, I'll, I'll very loosely group them into, into two categories. The first one, the top five, all describe the election and its pur purpose. They're process stories. None of them include any quotes. None of those five stories include any quotes. And three out of five of them do not list the candidates. Three out of the five headlines pose a question. Two of the, other, the two other ones just state the blunt facts, and only the word battle in those five headlines suggests any attempt to generate an angle, but that story doesn't actually involve any kind of clashing between candidates. It's, again, just a kind of generated angle, trying to add something to it. The other, those stories all run between pages 14 and 40. The other stories, the other five, rely on, on narratives that are much more familiar in political journalism. Conflict, fear and bad news. Three out, of, three out of those ten headlines directly reference voter apathy and they use language which is quite notable. Fears, obscure, concern, looms. Looms a word which foretells disaster. An election looming has a kind of negative connotation to it. Storms tend to loom. Um, these stories run in a page range from 2 to 16. Only two of those stories find a new angle on the election. Um, the top two there, both from the Medway Messenger. Um, that paper was also the only paper to run a hustings event um, in the build-up. And I think it would be fair to say that 
that newspaper in particular has a pet interest in this kind of local election story. That the additional interest added by the Medway Messenger reflects a pet interest of that paper. But on the whole, in the KM group, they didn't think that the elections had inherent news value. It's a, it's a conclusion I draw from this. But that they saw value in the failure of the elections. They saw more value in that than they saw in the elections themselves. I interviewed Paul, Paul Francis about this, and he admitted that the elections were very tricky and challenging to cover. He agreed with the Electoral Commission that holding the elections in November was a very difficult. It meant that the KM was starting to get into a softer news agenda as it runs into Christmas, has different deadlines as it runs into that time, starting to plan ahead for the difficult Christmas period when you have to fill papers in much less time. And that meant that perhaps it didn't dedicate quite the resources that it could have done to covering the election. But he said the biggest problem was a fear of politicising the police. There was a YouGov poll on the eve of the election, October 2012, that said that 61% of voters disapproved of police and crime commissioner candidates being sponsored by political, by political parties. And Paul thinks that had a, fillet, a chilling effect on the campaign, that effectively candidates were scared of saying anything that might appear like they were running party lines, trying to bring politics into the police. So they ended up just repeating the same bland statements as each other with very little conflict or differentiation. He said to me, how many stories would our readers be interested in, in candidate X saying I would put victims at the heart of all my policies, and then candidate Y saying I would put victims at the heart of all my policies. There is very little news value in that kind of thing, that the absence of conflict essentially is a problem for this election. And you can see that, in, uh, I promised we'd come back to this, um, in this grid, a very familiar format in local election coverage, a same set of questions sent to all candidates and then given equal space for their responses. Um, we see a lot of very bland phrases appearing from all different candidates, and, and to be honest I don't need to attribute those, those quotes at the bottom there because all of them could have said the same thing. They want to focus on cutting crime, a zero tolerance to crime, uh, making sure that Kent policing is transparent, all very difficult to disagree with. The value to voters of this kind of, of coverage is negligible um, because of the lack of difference between the candidate, candidates. And there has been some work done on this idea of kind of trying to take a neutral line in elections. The idea that giving every candidate equal space will somehow enable the electorate to make a better choice. Um, Michael Temple um, published in 2005 a study of the Sentinel in Staffordshire, which took a focus group approach to covering a local election in 2003. It went out and asked a large number of readers what they thought the 10 most important topics were in the election that year. Um, and then they each week based a major feature around one of those topics, quoting each candidate equally. Um, and the turnout in, in Stafford that year was 2% lower than the year before. Um, he said that they can't necessarily take all of the blame for that, but they, they did show that they failed to energise an electorate with that kind of coverage. Um, one of the biggest problems that he encountered in that was that a massive issue that year in, in those elections was BNP and race, and people weren't prepared to admit that was going to be an issue in advance. Um, that when they went out and focus groups, essentially the biggest issue wasn't mentioned because people were embarrassed to bring it up. Um, but he. he concluded that the culpability of local newspapers may lie not in their alleged dumbing down or in any failure to cover local politics in sufficient detail, but in their continuing commitment to high journalistic standards and rational debate. He felt that we might be being too even-handed and too fair and trying to be too informative and that ultimately trying to impose a narrative, a more stronger story on the elections might be a better idea. And certainly that's something which um, I want to think about in, in the context of this kind of coverage. Um, only two KM titles ran this um, coverage in print. The rest of them um, ran it on, uh, as an online thing only with the um, link at the bottom there, which I don't know whether you can see it, but it's particularly unfriendly to type in, very long, um, not exactly accessible to the audience. So if they weren't covering uh, policy, they weren't covering the normal conflict narratives, then what were Kent Messenger Papers covering in these stories? This is the Kentish Express uh, in the week of the vote. The paragraph two of this story said, amid continuing fears that turnout could hit an all-time low for an election, Kent's six candidates stepped up their efforts to galvanise voters. Again, an unattributed reference to fears. Paragraphs three to five are up on the screen, and you can see what they're covering here are very typical election events. They're covering high-profile political visits into constituencies to try and drum up support for candidates, something which we're very aware of as an election tactic and something we would expect newspapers to cover. The Kentish Express, which is based in Ashford, quotes Martin Bell, but not David Miliband. It quotes Bell because he appeared in Ashford, Miliband didn't. It makes a point that saying Harriet Yeo, the Labour candidate, 
was from Ashford. It doesn't say where other candidates lived. Um, the kind of detail about where candidates lived is very important to local newspapers, but it's difficult to see in the context of an election campaign how this was relevant or what, election, uh, what the electorate was supposed to do with that information. Are you more likely to think positively about a candidate just because they live in the same town as you? Seems rather unlikely. And we have a, we have a, sp a special interest in her. Um, no. Uh, it seems more likely that the paper is demonstrating parochial news values here, that essentially they're taking what, would, what Harcourt would regard as the relevance of a story, the local relevance to its audience, and pushing that to an extreme with a kind of parochialism, which focuses on the fact that this stuff happened in our town, rather than the bigger issues that should have come out of a county-wide election campaign. Um, and quite possibly this is a, a kind of, a, a, the structure of the KM possibly playing against a little bit the structure of the elections. The similar thing, or I won't dwell on it too much, a similar thing happened in Medway. Uh, in the week of the vote, they found a local angle by talking to a returning officer and filled their story with facts about how many polling stations there would be, what time they would be open, and how many staff would be manning them. It's valid local information, but again, not particularly useful to an electorate. Uh, the quote reassures their readers that we have been planning this election for some time. Um, you would hope so. Um, so, just again, anecdotally, were readers asking for information? How, 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 to what degree does the apathy extend through to readers? Um, this is a very anecdotal. It's very difficult to draw any major conclusions from letters, but the KM, across its various different editions, did publish letters every week, giving us an anecdotal picture of the public's thirst for information. Um, you can see here, people were frustrated about the lack of information about candidates, and that the most engaged readers, the kind of people who are likely to send letters to local newspapers, are likely to be more engaged in the public sphere generally. They felt let down by the way that the election was organised and covered, to the point that it might affect their voting habits. They also reflected a concern about the role of politics in the police. The drawing to an end. Um, Election campaigns deliver us conflicting narratives, that's kind of what they do about our society, and they invite the electorate to identify with them. But this election was mainly a process story, it was mainly about how the election worked and apathy, um, the kind of lack of interest in how the election worked, were the two main priorities in the coverage. But we saw earlier that the second most popular topic for newspapers to cover in campaigns was crime. And those issues didn't go away. Issues about justice, fairness and safety did not fade away during the election campaign. So this story, um, an exclusive story to the Kent Messenger, the toll of officers made to leave police force, exposing severe disciplinary problems within the police, with one police officer in Kent sacked or forced to resign every three months, made no reference to the elections. This was published during the campaign. Uh, it, it was published both by the Kentish Gazette and the Medway Messenger, neither of which linked it to the election. The Medway Messenger on um, November the 2nd, so um, just over, you know, two weeks before the poll, ran a crime-themed page which included an illegally parked police van and a man who had been a burglary victim talking about fear of crime, again without linking it in any way to the election. So there were potentially missed stories and missed narratives here. <coughs> so what point does the narrative become compelling? Well, it, it's perhaps telling that the first time that the election appears on a front page in Kent is the day, or two days, after the election result comes out. Police farce, apathy wins. This front page treatment result reflects the magnitude of that result in terms of its disaster in our, in our kind of democratic history. I think it's a British, the, the lowest turnout in British peacetime history. Um, they saw the greatest news value in this failure. Apathy won, perhaps, because it got the mo more coverage than any other candidate. And in fact, when you sometimes you read about apathy, you might almost believe it was a candidate in this election. <laughs> Six months later, it was on the front pages again. And this was another bad news story, and perhaps the most notorious story uh, in Kent relating to PCCs, which was when Anne Barnes elected or appointed a youth police and crime commissioner, um, who was forced to resign before she had spent any time in the, in the role. Um, she was described in the Mail on Sunday who went through her Twitter history as a foul-mouthed and self-obsessed teen. Um, she'd been caught out making homophobic and, and other kind of uh, very derogatory remarks on Twitter. Um, Anne Barnes responded to criticism, which eventually ended up with, with, with this girl having to resign the post before she had taken it up, by pointing out that she had a mandate to create this role, that she had promised the people of Kent that this was what she was going to do, and therefore she was honour-bound to see it into being. 
Paul Francis wrote the obituary to this policy, saying that it was the centrepiece of Anne Barnes' election campaign, but that some believe she has been guilty of elevating PR above all else. It's a claim she has rejected, but it is, but it is undeniably the case that her administration pays considerable attention to her media profile. There was certainly a lot of fanfare at the time that she appointed Paris Brown to be her Youth Police and Crime Commissioner. They appeared together on BBC Breakfast. But what about during the election campaign itself? In the three weeks before the poll, this was the only reference made in Kent Messenger coverage to that role. It appears as part of that big grid uh, under the question, will you accept the £85,000 salary? To which he said, yes, but I'll use some of it towards the Youth Commissioner role. There is no explanation of what the Youth Commissioner role actually is. This was only run in the Kent Messenger series around Maidstone and the Kentish Express series in Ashford. More was available online, but only using that rather clunky URL that was printed on the page. And in fact, that URL wasn't promoted at all in Canterbury or in Sittingbourne. The policy was expanded on further in Anne Barnes' campaign literature, but she targeted that at postal voters. And, and, and so even if the postal votes won the election for her and those people were aware, it's still a tiny overall proportion of Kent's electorate that would have been aware of what her policy was. The policy that she said she was honour bound to see into being and led to her reappointing to the role rather disastrously when the second candidate had to resign over claims that she'd had an affair with the councillor in Thanet. Um, so what we've seen, I think, what I've seen in this coverage is that the Police and Crime Commissioner elections failed to provide a compelling narrative for the electorate. It was partly the fault of the government, which failed to make information about candidates accessible, partly a product of a supplementary vote system, which makes it harder to identify front runners and likely winners, because the fight is often for second preference votes rather than first place. And it was partly the fault of candidates who failed to differentiate themselves from their rivals for, appear for fear of appearing too political. It was partly the fault of the media, for beige coverage that never strayed from the bland mes messages of candidates. What that means for this year, in 2013, YouGov did a survey saying that 54% of people said they did not understand the PCC role. That was 6% higher than in 2012. So the, the, the level of ignorance about this role had gone up after they were in place. Paul Francis told me that he thinks Anne, Anne Barnes' decision not to run is something of a shame, possibly even a disaster for the PCC race in Kent this year, because she is its strongest story. He said that her triumph against the odds narrative potentially would have spiced up this campaign and the absence of it leaves us again talking about process. And it isn't just process this time, now it's going to be up against a couple of other very big narratives. The election is going to be held in May. In certain parts of the county there will be local elections where a national focus will be on whether Jeremy Corbyn can actually get some kind of a result out of the local council elections. A month after this poll, just over a month after, the EU referendum is going to be held. And that's going to be a dominant narrative throughout this part of the year. The PCC election is going to struggle to be heard um, among much stronger electoral stories. And that kind of picks up to where I'm going to start this year. So I'll foresee um, a comment about the fact that my, um, my data was incomplete. Um, and my original research was, was based on, on Kent Messenger coverage, and this time I'm going to cover a much broader sample uh, of paid-for titles in Kent and broadcast coverage of the elections in Kent. And I'm going to do it between April the 7th and May the 5th, which is from the moment that the candidates are nominated through to the election itself. My, my research hypothesis, based on what I've, I've looked at in 2012, is that the placement of stories will generally reflect a similar trend, that stories will not be covered at the front end and on right-hand pages. The areas with local council elections, I believe, will be more likely to cover the election, but the election will be not comparatively visible compared to the other elections going on. But I think in, in areas like, I mean, Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells has local council elections this year, I think that will give it the opportunity to cover the PCC elections. A place like Ashford doesn't have any other election going on, I think it might take the opinion that people don't care enough possibly to engage with it. And that feeding into that, I think that apathy and public engagement issues will continue to be the dominant themes. But I will be interested uh, in the current climate in Kent to see how big dominant narratives in our local media agenda here play into the campaign. The cost of Operation Stack, the th worry about the, the, the burden of illegal immigrants coming over and the cost to Kent Police of having to patrol that, added to the fear that the Calais Agreement might end and what that might mean for Kent Police if even more people are coming over the channel. The rise of knife and gang crime in Medway has been covered very extensively here. 
um, and seems to be a, a ripe opportunity to get um, candidates talking about an interesting issue that will actually engage a, a, an audience here. And I'll be looking out for those narratives in the coverage as well. And that's really it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Um, to what extent do you think the coverage of local newspapers of something that was a national policy to have PCC elections mm -hmm. um, was hampered by the fact that the narrative was already set? People had already decided through national media that this was a terrible idea. They didn't like the idea of politicised this, and as a result, the care group were reacting rather than setting the agenda. I think that's probably right, and I think I think it isn't just the it isn't just the electorate's um, opinions that were set in that way. I think it's also the journalists. I, I, I think that the government didn't actually fail to win over people like Paul Francis, that this was a really worthwhile exercise. And I think that that makes it then harder to sell on, doesn't it? Um, I, think, I think that's right. I, I, but, but nevertheless, I think there were opportunities here to talk about the fear of crime, to talk about some very specific issues that people would care about in this context. And I don't know whether it's necessarily the media's job to whip up electorate um, and to try and get the vote out in some major way, but there was an opportunity here to talk about some issues that would have been quite interesting and important, I think, locally. Um, and you're, you're probably right, I think that the fact that it was framed in, in such a way very early on probably was one of the reasons why that didn't happen. Yeah. And do you think there's any chance that will improve the organic ground, or is it no. worse? I think, I think the, the fact that there are local council elections which will be seen as more important, the fact that the EU referendum is happening, so you, what you're talking about, the national debate being framed, I don't think the Police and Crime Commissioner elections will feature at all, particularly in a national um, perspective. Um, locally, you might see a little bit of coverage, but I don't, I, I don't see it getting better. I, I, I think that the apathy that people are feeling that felt in 2012 is still there and I think the newspapers won't particularly feel encouraged to challenge it. Go on, Tim. Well, it was a very simple one. But I wonder whether you've thought about just adding an element of a resourcing question into the new study. You reflected very accurately the extent to which in 2012 this coverage was essentially written by one report. Mm. Um, and the Underlying question I suggest there is, did the papers actually have the want to dedicate reporting staff to try to flesh out what Paul done and give it a more specific local angle mm. to identify local issues which could create attention, a narrative with this bit of conflict in it. Um, to the extent they didn't do that in 2012, they're going to be even less yeah. well equipped to do it in 2016. Because they'll already be covering other elections. Yes, there were fewer reporters and they'll be covering the other elections, yeah. that's right. And that's true in BBC. Yep. In Kent, it's true almost everywhere except on my second point was why don't you look at Can TV? Well, I, I will have, to, yes, absolutely right. When I'm saying broadcasters, I will look at KM TV, and that's part of the Kent Messenger's output as well, obviously. <laughs> Essentially. Um, certainly under the branding, it is. Um, yes, of course I will, yes. Resourcing and the ability to cover the local public sphere. Mm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Go. If we go back to national coverage for a little bit, because Kitchens, and you were right to point out that when it happened, they were framed as this is a terrible idea. And in the space between the last elections and this election, the only mention I've seen constant in national coverage is people like Ollie Martins, who's the PCC from Bedfordshire, yep. who's come out to say that he's going to sell ad space on police uniforms because he's writing for yeah. money. Which he can't actually do, I think, yes. Yeah, and yeah. it's not just him, there's other people who come out with incredibly fantastical ideas. How much do you think that also feeds into this whole apathy of people dismissing not just the, the candidate but the post and the office? Yeah, I mean, there's been very negative coverage. I mean, Anne Barnes is one of the most visible police and crime commissioners there is uh, on a national scale because of a series of catastrophes, essentially, from um, from um, the Paris Brown affair through to the, the Channel 4 documentary through to um, uh, at least having questions about whether or not she was caught driving with, without insurance. Um, I think that hasn't helped. I think that the, the coverage of them generally has been as, as, as a kind of bungling group of public officials, um, and I think that, that that has helped to frame the narrative. There has been a, a, a kind of counter movement from within the government. So if, if, you, if you've been looking, Theresa May is talking about expanding their powers in all kinds of quite interesting ways. Give them control of fire authorities, for example, as well as the police, or um, sort of um, 
getting them involved in, in rehabilitation of young offenders in kind of interesting ways. They're trying to try and justify the role. Um, the problem is that that's getting no traction whatsoever. And I, I think you're right that, that that negativity has just kind of been reinforced over the period of time. Do you think that the characterisation, which Ambarnes has not single handedly enabled, certainly encouraged, yeah. will be reflected in coverage in 2016, and could your discourse analysis consider whether the Police and Crime Commission are treated in a way that has been coloured by that buffoon reputation? I think that's, that's interesting. I think, to a degree, it would be a lot easier to talk about that if she was running again, and I think that to a to a degree, you know, she's going to get off the hook on, on that, but I think that there is a general feeling that maybe, you know, are we getting the right calibre of candidate for this role? And the scrutiny of that, I think that becomes incredibly interesting in Kent because of some of the people that have said they're going to stand. Um, and, I mean, it's no, no secret, obviously, that, that um, Fergus Wilson has said he's going to stand, and, and there is some question about whether he's allowed to because of a conviction that he had. Um, but he's a very interesting candidate in that kind of way. And I think the personal scrutiny of candidates um, didn't happen at all in 2012. Um, if it had have happened, we might have seen the flaws in Anne Barnes's plans around Youth Police and Crime Commissioners, for example. Whether that lesson has been learned, I, don't, I think Paul Francis would like to think that, that maybe it has, but I think that comes back to the resource issue. How do we, how do we properly get under the skin of these people in the run-up to the election? And there's also that, a desire element to this as well. I mean, I think that, that resolutely neutral tone will continue. And I think that in local newspapers, certainly in Kent, I'm sure in a lot of other places, won't want to be seen to be attacking any particular candidates in any, in any way. I think that's why, in the build-up to 2012, there wasn't a very deep analysis of Anne Barnes despite the fact that she was already in the job. You know, Anne Barnes was the chair of the Kent Police Authority. We could have looked quite closely at her performance over that time. But that didn't happen because I think that that, that could have been construed either as an endorsement or an attack. And I think that, that becomes something that's difficult for regional papers. So they might stay away from it. Do you, I don't know. Go on. Yeah, my, my question is, I'm asking because I'm international and I don't really understand what the rules. I know that you've practiced for years. Do you feel that your election laws are somehow to blame for some of the lapses? Because if the media is supposed to generate interest among the electorate, and yet they are restricted by the kind of things they can cover, and so the, elect the electorate is not getting the information they need to whip up their interest to vote, can we blame the laws? Or what did you find? There's kind of two, two things. I mean, there aren't that many restrictions on what you can cover from within the newspapers. From, different for broadcasters. Broadcasters have a, a slightly different obligation in terms of their balance. But for newspapers, there aren't that many restrictions on what you can cover. And, and certainly the information deficit that there was could have been filled a little bit better from within the regional press. The problem is that the government didn't provide that information at source, so it, it didn't send out information to residents, it didn't create a website where there was an easy summary of what the, count, of what the various different candidates were standing for. And crucially, it didn't allow a free delivery of an election yeah. address, which has been common in every general and local municipal election mm. in Britain since 1945. Yep. It's the first time that they didn't fund free delivery. And these issues were picked up by the Electoral Commission straight after this election and were supposed to be addressed for 2016. We'll see exactly how efficiently that works. That doesn't affect the media's ability to coverage. It just affects the electorate's ability to get information. So I, I don't think there's any particular worry about the media's ability to cover these elections beyond their capacity to from within their own reporting staff. I think it's, it's more about there should be information available easily all over the place, and there wasn't. Yep. Um, can I make a couple of questions or points from an outsider? Please do, yeah. Um, the first is that I have no idea how the Kent Messenger group is organised. Mm. It seems bewildering. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> with the numbers of stories that you gave mm. me, I thought, oh, that's a small number of stories. Mm. But not much more apart from that. And I wonder if just numbers is the best way to 
display that? Well, that's why I then try to pick out the stories and go into I think I think the, the analysis of the treatment of the stories is more important than the numbers, yeah. to be honest. The numbers were there just to, just to add a little bit of context to see the extent of the coverage. But you're right, without point of comparison, that could be it's something yeah. I can think about. The, yeah. the, the, the other, one of the other questions was going to be, are there comparative statistics for local elections or for other kinds of elections? Certainly, I would... I, I, I don't know that they're available. Certainly in Kent, I don't think they're available, but I would be able to do it. Um, so I think it would be enormously useful. I mean, I, I would certainly be able to go back. I mean, this year in particular, I, I think as part of my, I've already been thinking about part of my coverage will be comparing how much coverage the local elections get in the areas that are holding them compared to the Police and Crime Commissioner elections. I think that would be an interesting balance, but I think I could probably go further than that. I think that's an interesting point. Thank you. And the only other thing was, Presumably, these um, the newspapers have websites. Yep. Is it possible to use sharing statistics from the stories that they publish on the websites as a, a way to look at engagement? Yes, I think it probably would be. Yes, again, it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say, just in terms of like the um, have you got like any data or have you looked into like how much? Um, Local papers, such as Kentish Gazette and that didn't cover it at all, have covered Ann Barnes's reign, so to speak. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, they, the papers did pick up, and I haven't done the same kind of analysis as, as edition by edition as I did during the election campaign, I'll be honest. But those papers all ran the stories about Paris Barnes, they all ran the stories about the insurance claims, they all ran the stories about the Channel 4 documentary. Um, because at that point, I think it's just clear that the, the news value of the story has changed at that point. That buffoonery element has so much more attraction to it, to a, to a journalist and to an audience, than the simple facts of an election do. Um, I think it might be interesting, actually, to do a coverage, to do a look at, at that more scientifically. But the, certainly they did all cover it. Yeah. So I was just going to say, I mean, obviously it's like I sort of feel like because she's not rerunning, it might get completely swept under the carpet. I kind of agree with the quote you've got from Paul, but like, if she was rerunning, there might have been more. There, I think there would be automatically be a lot more interest, yeah, because she's become. So do you think it, yeah. someone's going to like? I mean, you mentioned someone else before, but like, do you think that someone's going to jump into like the food spot? <laughs> I think I have to be very careful how I answer that question. Um, but I th there are certainly some strong personalities in the running. The problem is whether they come across. So, um, as I say, I mean, uh, um, Fergus Wilson will be, will be an interesting candidate. Um, for those of you who don't know who he is, he was um, uh, half of a buy-to-let property empire in Kent. Um, and a figure of some local controversy, uh, but he, he, he was um, the first buy-to-let billionaire in the UK, I believe. Um, yeah, well, I'm aware I'm being recorded. I'm aware, very aware that I'm being recorded. There's also, um, I, I'm, I'm not... We'll go with be outspoken. Yes. Um, and... and uh, um, there are other candidates that are of interest. Paul Francis is, was talking to me, that, um, he, he, he's been a bit closer to this than I have at this point in the, in the election campaign, that there's a UKIP candidate that actually has everything pretty much that you would want from a police and crime commissioner. Services record, um, he's, he's been decorated for his, his, his kind of service to the army and all this kind of stuff. Um, the kind of person that you would expect to be a very good candidate, except for the fact that he's running with a UKIP badge. And, the, with the fears about politicisation of the police, that becomes an enormous issue because even people who might normally vote UKIP might think, do I want that in the police? Um, now, those are interesting questions and I think that they're, they're questions that candidates should have to answer and I think that people would be interested in getting further into that. So, okay, so what does it mean to be a UKIP candidate with a record like yours for this job? I just don't know whether that story's going to come across. I don't know whether it's going to be told. Um, I think it is, is part of the problem. Yep. If you were in the position of editor of one of the titles, what weight would you give to this? It'd be lovely to say on front page every week, wouldn't it? Um, except it doesn't work that way. Um, there, there is, I mean, the, the point of analysing this in comparison to news values is that at the time there are other stories going on that are of more immediate interest to your readers, and you have to be aware of that. I'd like to think. I think that the Gravesend Messenger's spirit 
in the build-up to selection was was laudable. I think it, it, it fumbled the ball a little bit on the way through, but it, it wrote a leader telling its readers that it was important. It put a story on page nine, which is you know, fairly prominent, um, which wanted to tell its readers all about this election and name the candidates and everything else. I think that that's roughly the right approach. I just think that possibly um, they then got a little bit mixed up between important and negative, and, and, and it kind of ended up being a bit of a mixed message. I mean, on, on that issue, is that on, on your research hypothesis about placement in particular, mm. the whole events the boy element of that, and the random nature of movement production, mm. frankly, yeah. how, you know, does that undermine the value of that aspect? Of it? And also, if you are broadening your sampling to BBC coverage, then how are you going to deal with that placement issue there? Well, I think it's going to have to be a kind of horses for courses approach to that to that analysis. So I think I can analyse newspaper output in terms of where it appears in a newspaper. I think that the it would have to be much more of a content analysis of what the BBC does. Well, you, can, you can do it by radio, you can do it by people doing these types. Yep. So it appears that I mean, you, you, the people doing these types for radio accounts are very clearly available. So if it's a 7.30, 8 o'clock or 8.30 item, it really matters if it's between 7.30 and 8, it matters quite a lot. Um, so you can, I, mean, I, can, I can help you with that. Okay. That's it. In television news, it's whether it's running in the first 10 minutes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I come out? Well, sorry, if I can just finish answering Ian first. I mean, the other, the other half of that, and you're right, there is a certain kind of um, randomness to the way that stories end up in the paper, which is affected by all kinds of other things that are going on. Um, there is, I, mean, I think that the thing it highlights, talking about placement in that way, is just the visibility of the stories. It might well be that you can't, you can't necessarily get inside the head of a news editor and try and rationalise it too logic. Oh, they thought it was this important, like a game of top trumps, you know, this was 25 out of 30. I think you've got to be careful about how you draw your conclusions on that. But there is something quite interesting about the, the broad placement of stories that tells you, I mean, the fact that in the week of the election, three stories were page 30 or further back, tells you something about the fact that these weren't particularly visible stories and the news editors didn't particularly value them. And these were stories that weren't late breaking and put into the first available space. This was, sto this was coverage that was planned early on in the week for a weekly title. So um, I think there is value in it. I think it just has to have a few little provisos attached to it. Yeah. Sorry, Tim. Uh, just because it followed on naturally, it's a bit more of a suggestion than, than a question. Um, you talk very well about the extent, extent of the absence of conflict between candidates reduced their news value mm. as a story. Surely it also reduces their democratic value too. Yes. If there's no difference of opinion between candidates, why should you bother to make a choice? So why don't you turn the lens round and look a little bit about the content of what the politicians themselves have said? Mm. Because the news value is diminished for a reason. Yes, that's probably true. I think, I think probably in the context of this, that might be a second article from the same set of data. Um, and it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, um, go on, you haven't had a go yet. Yeah, thanks, It's interesting uh, research. Um, I just start when you said that uh, this kind of notion, if you build it, they will come. Mm. So they built it and... They didn't. They didn't really come, did they? No. And I remember at the time, people asking, well, should we at least have a referendum about whether we want this before we have a vote about <laughs> yeah. who we should have? I wonder what the turnout for that would have been, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it seems, I don't know whether you're, whether you're seeking to be particularly critical of any aspects. Uh, I don't know, but I mean, it seems like the KM certainly aren't in favour of this. It's like the, the, the coverage was so limited for such a long period of time, mm. including stories without quotes, yep. followed by a front page story, describing what a fast the whole thing had become. And I appreciate that we report on things that are said, but also we are in a position to ask questions as well. Yeah. And to and to draw on the defence that nothing was said that was worth saying, well go back and ask more questions then. And and you know, they they're in a position, a unique position to be able to create interest in this story. Yeah. You could just as easily have done a story quoting people with the headline that said why it's important you vote. Yeah. In, this, in, this, in this crucial uh, brand new election. So from your research, it seems as if there was either kind of a total lack of appetite for it or a general sense that it wasn't something which was needed. I think a bit of both. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think that's right. I mean, I, th I think that's essentially what I was concluding about 2012, that, that the paper paid it lip service. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think essentially that's, that's, that's what I'm looking at this time around to see whether that's changed in any way in four years. I want to put this, 
the, this was 2012, so we'd had uh, 2010, um, no single party winning a, a you know, majority mm. election. We then had, was it a year later when there was the referendum for AUV, which went down like a yep. balloon. So I think, you know, there was also this a natural, a national negativity towards politics and the things that politicians were proposing. Yeah, I mean, I think I, seeing it in context of that of that referendum is quite interesting. I think I think there's, there's partially a problem, and I think I, it, it's been going on for a while now. I think it's a problem that stems back into into kind of the Gordon Brown era of the, of the Labour Party, where the idea that more democracy must mean better democracy, the idea that people should have a choice about as, as many things as possible, and um, I mean, it's just personal opinion; it doesn't come out of the research at all, but. But I think that there is a question here about whether or not people are being asked the right questions. The AV referendum was a very good example of asking people a question they didn't understand and then getting back something um, which showed that they just didn't want to engage with it. This, very similar. Um, then you look at something as clear-cut as a Scottish referendum in-out vote where it gets an enormous amount of response because it, it, it seems to matter. You know? and, and I think that there is, there is a question there about the, the kinds of questions that are being asked. But, I'm not necessarily probing that in this work, I don't think. Yeah, thanks. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you.